Good afternoon. Our next item today is a statement by the Lord Advocate on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill, referenced by the Attorney General and the Advocate General for Scotland to the UK Supreme Court. Now, the Lord Advocate will take questions at the end of his statement. Uh, I would urge those who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I will call the Lord, the Lord Advocate. Sir. <clears throat> This morning, the Supreme Court handed down its judgment on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Members will recall that I made a statement to this Parliament on the introduction of the bill, setting out the government's analysis of it and answered questions on it. And I ha I'm happy to appear again today and to make a statement on the judgment. The bill was introduced to ensure that on any scenario, the Scottish Government and this Parliament would have the tools necessary to, to prepare Scotland within their devolved responsibilities for the legislative consequences of leaving the European Union. It was passed by this Parliament on the 21st of March. On 17th April, the UK Government's law officers referred the bill to the Supreme Court. That reference meant that the bill could not be presented for royal assent and accordingly could not become law until the reference was determined. On 20th June, while the reference was pending before the Supreme Court, the UK Parliament passed the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, and that Act received royal assent on the 26th of June. That Act imposes new limits on the legislative competence of this Parliament. In particular, it imposes a new limit, which has the effect that an Act of the Scottish Parliament cannot now modify the EU Withdrawal Act itself. The UK Act is now what is called a protected enactment. The provision which made that change in the law took effect when the Withdrawal Act received royal assent on the 26th of June. As a result of this sequence of events, the Supreme Court has had to address two issues. First, whether the Continuity Bill was within the competence of this Parliament when it passed the bill. And second, whether the position has been affected by the changes which were made to the legislative competence of this Parliament after it passed the Continuity Bill and in particular the new limit which prevents an act of this Parliament modifying the EU Withdrawal Act itself. On the first issue, the Court has concluded that at the time when this Parliament passed the Continuity Bill, that bill was, with the exception of one section, Section 17, within the competence of this Parliament. In reaching that conclusion, the Court has confirmed the constitutional analysis which I, along with the other devolved law officers, advanced in our submissions to the court. And it has affirmed this Parliament's power, subject to the limits on its competence, to prepare the statute book against the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Yeah. The court has rejected all of the submissions which were advanced by the UK government's law officers on the first issue, with the exception of one argument in relation to section 17. Section 17 would have required the consent of Scottish ministers before certain subordinate legislation made by ministers of the Crown could take effect in Scotland. The court has concluded that this section would modify section 28.7 of the Scotland Act 1998 and would for that reason not be within the legislative competence of this parliament. On the second issue, the court has rejected the submission by the UK government's law officers that the coming into force of the EU Withdrawal Act means that the whole continuity bill would now be out with the competence of this parliament. However, the Court has concluded that as a result of the new limit on the legislative competence of this Parliament, which be has been imposed by the EU Withdrawal Act, certain provisions of the Continuity Bill may not now become law. This was a new limit on this Parliament's competence imposed after the Continuity Bill was passed and contained in the EU Withdrawal Bill, a bill to which this Parliament did not consent. The Court has concluded that the following provisions of the Continuity Bill would modify provisions in the EU Withdrawal Act and for that reason cannot now become law. Sections 2, subsection 2, section 5, parts of section 7, subsection 8, 2, sections 9a and 9b, parts of section 10, section 11, certain other provisions so far as they apply to or refer to section 11, Section 26A, subsection 6, and parts of section 33 and schedule 1. Had the Continuity Bill become law before the EU Withdrawal Act received royal assent, 
all of these provisions would have survived. Mm. Mm. Of these provisions, members will note in particular Section 5, which would have preserved the Charter of Fundamental Rights in domestic law, and Section 11, the power to fix deficiencies in retained devolved EU law. As a result of the new limits imposed on this Parliament by the EU Withdrawal Act, neither of these provisions can now become law, at least in their current form. Shame. The Scottish Government will consider ways in which the values reflected in the Charter of Fundamental Rights can continue to be given <coughs> effect in Scots law should the UK leave the U European Union. And as members are well aware, the Scottish Government is fulfilling and will continue to fulfil its responsibilities to ready the statute book against withdrawal from the European Union against using the powers in the EU Withdrawal Act. On the other hand, provisions of the Continuity Bill which can become law now that we have the Supreme Court's judgment include the powers in Section 12 in relation to international obligations, the powers in Section 13 to keep pace with EU law after exit day, and the provisions of Section 26A on environmental principles, except that part of subsection 6, which deals with the approach to interpretation of those principles. The Scottish Government accepts the judgment of the Supreme Court in its entirety. The Government will wish to consider the terms of the judgment carefully, and I understand that the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business and Constitutional Relations intends to have discussions with all parties across the Parliament before determining uh, the way forward. Thank you very much. The Lord Advocate will now take questions. We we'll start with Adam Tompkins, to be followed by Neil Findlay. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Lord Advocate for early sight of his statement, and I look forward to the discussions between the parties with the Cabinet Secretary that the Lord Advocate just referred to. Today's Supreme Court ruling, Presiding Officer, is a clear, unambiguous, and, of course, unanimous judicial vindication for those of us who considered that the SNP's so-called continuity bill unlawful as one. As as one, the Supreme Court has today ruled that it would be contrary to law for the bill as passed by this Parliament to proceed to royal assent. Now, during the passage, during the passage of the Continuity Bill through this Parliament, numerous Scottish Conservative amendments, some in my name and some in the names of my colleagues on these benches, sought to amend the bill so that it would be compatible and not an unlawful modification of the EU Withdrawal Act. Those amendments were rejected by this Parliament and as such the UK Supreme Court today has eviscerated this bill, leaving it in tatters. Everything, everything in this bill that is incompatible with the EU Withdrawal Act, page after page after page, has been removed by the Supreme Court. So, presiding officer, what's left? What's left? Is it not the case, Lord Advocate, that all that remains of this always unnecessary legislation are provisions that simply and wholly needlessly repeat or replicate provisions of the Withdrawal Act? As such, is it not the case that there is no need for this Parliament to reconsider any of this legislation? What Parliament should do is bin it. Lord Advocate. Thank you. I Presiding officer, I'll confine my remarks to uh, the legal aspects of the question and I'll leave political comment to, 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 to others. To As I explained in my statement, it's important to look at this bill um, in two stages, just as the um, just as the Supreme Court has done. And it's clear that um, at the time when this Parliament passed the bill, it was in its entirety, with the exception of one section, uh, within the competence of this Parliament. In, in the reference, the UK law officers mounted a whole-scale attack on the bill, with the exception of that single argument, that attack was comprehensively rebuffed. After this, after this Parliament passed the bill, a bill which had it then come into force would, with the exception of Section 17, have been entirely within the competence of this Parliament. Um, the UK Government um, invited the UK Parliament to pass the EU uh, Withdrawal Act. 
Uh, that was an act to which this Parliament did not give its consent. Uh, that act contains new limits on the powers of this Parliament and, in particular, makes the act itself a protected enactment. That particular provision, that particular provision um, came into force on royal assent as a result of an amendment made to the EU withdrawal bill, as it then was, uh, at report stage. Uh, and as a result of that particular listen, limitation... Listen to it. Listen. Just listen to it. As a result, of, the, as a result of that particular limitation, um, s certain provisions of the bill can no, can no longer now come into force. That remains important. That leaves important provisions important provisions, including the keeping pace power, the environmental principles, yeah. the provisions in relation to international obligations. Uh, and importantly, um, because this is an important constitutional judgment, importantly, uh, the um, constitutional analysis which uh, I advanced along with the other devolved law officers in relation to the devolution settlement uh, was uh, comprehensively sustained by the Supreme Court. Thank you. Now, just before we proceed, uh, I'm just conscious, Lord Advocate, you've been caught in a bit of a crossfire here. Uh, if SNP members are going to heckle the questions, then it's difficult for me to stop the Lord Advocate being heckled in return. So can I just ask... Well, I'm sorry. Well, can I say, can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, the two Cabinet Secretaries at the front row are amongst the worst offenders here. You're having a dialogue beyond, over the Lord Advocate's uh, spoken comments to the front bench of the Conservative Party. Can I just ask, possibly we'd have a better exchange if we allow the questions to be asked and the answers to be given. Well, we'll try. I live in hope. Neil Findlay. As always, I will conduct myself impeccably, President Officer. Uh, after the... Uh, after the week the Tories have had, I would have thought that Mr Tompkins would have uh, been better with some uh, humility in his approach rather than his arrogance. <laughs> yeah, I thank, the, uh, thank uh, the Lord Advocate for the sight of his statement. Um, Scottish Labour, along with the Liberals and the Greens, worked with the Scottish Government on the Continuity Bill. We shared their ideas, we put forward amendments to improve the Bill. All, all this was done constructively, positively and in good faith and we will do so again to try and bring about the best outcome from this ruling <coughs> excuse me uh, as a result of the, of the subsequent le legislation we now see that the courts, courts have ruled out uh, important elements of the continuity bill um, can the lord advocate advise what action the government proposed to take to make the legislation compliant and crucially crucially what time scale is there for doing so uh, no one, certainly not me, questions the integrity of either the Lord Advocate or the presiding officer. However, in light of this ruling, has the government been advised whether the, uh, the office of the presiding officer intends making a statement regarding the advice he was given uh, and which subsequently was given to Parliament? Uh, presiding officer, last week the UK government was held in contempt of Parliament for failing to publish legal advice it received on an issue of huge constitutional significance. Uh, the uh, Cabinet Secretary's party supported very vocally the call for that publication. In light of that, will the Lord Advocate now and the Cabinet Secretary now support a statutory commitment that in areas of major constitutional change, uh, legal advice to the government is published so that the public are made aware of it and can see and scrutinise it? I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary and his party would not wish to be accused of double standards or hypocrisy in this regard. Lord Advocate. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm grateful to Mr. Finlay for his uh, question. Um, and he, he was right to uh, acknowledge uh, at the outset that in this case, um, the rules by which competence are judged changed after this parliament uh, uh, passed uh, uh, the bill. Um, I understand that the Cabinet Secretary who's sitting next to me intends to enter into discussions with parties next week on the way forward. As a matter of the Parliament's standing orders, it's open to the member to bring the bill back to this Parliament for reconsideration uh, with a view to um, bringing it into 
um, compliance with the Supreme Court's uh, ruling. Uh, whether that's the right way forward, um, standing all the things that have happened um, since the bill was uh, passed by this Parliament, or whether another way forward is the right thing to do is something that the Cabinet Secretary will wish to discuss with, uh, with other parties. Um, on the final question in relation to uh, into legal advice, um, members of this Parliament are, are of course well aware of the long established principle that um, legal advice is not uh, normally published, but the Cabinet Secretary will be happy, as I understand, uh, it's not for me to speak for him, but I understand that he, he, he'll be happy to discuss uh, that further with, uh, with the member. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Parliament, unlike the UK Parliament, decided to keep the Charter of Fundamental Rights after EU exit, doing so in order that human rights protection would not suffer because of Brexit. Is my reading of the judgment correct, uh, Lord Advocate, and I think you've just confirmed that in your statement, the Supreme Court had decided that we were entitled to do just that. But by passing the EU Withdrawal Act, the UK Parliament has overridden that decision and as a result has struck down those bits of the continuity bill are struck down, as I've just said, particularly the issues in regard to the Charter or fundamental rights, which I think is an absolute disgrace that we're in that situation. Lord Advocate. Um, the member's um, analysis is, is, is I think, uh, correct. Um, the, uh, at the time when this Parliament passed the Continuity Bill, the provision which preserved the effect of the Charter and domestic law was within the competence of this Parliament. Uh, as a result of the provision in the UK Act, which um, uh, is to the effect that the Charter shall not form part of domestic law on withdrawal from the EU, um, that provision in this Parliament's bill uh, can no longer take effect. Donald Cameron to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, and can I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, the Lord Advocate made reference uh, in his statement to comments about um, the new limit on legislative competence imposed after the Continuity Bill was passed. Was the Scottish Government aware that at the time the UK Act was introduced in the UK Parliament as a bill, on the 13th of July 2017, it contained a clause specifically amending the Scotland Act 1998 and inserting the UK Bill as a protective provision? And as a result, does he agree that the intentions of the UK Government were open, explicit and clear in relation to this point from July 2017. Advocate. Yes. When the UK government's withdrawal bill was introduced to Parliament, it contained such a provision, but it was a provision which, in the state of the bill at that time, was to come into force um, by virtue of a commencement order. Oh. This. Uh, the Scottish Government, in bringing forward the Continuity Bill, proceeded on the basis that if this Parliament withheld its consent from the Withdrawal Bill, um, the conventional approach reflected in the Sewell Convention uh, 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 would be applied. Um, at a late stage in the passage of the Withdrawal Bill, I think at report stage in the House of Lords, on the 2nd of May 2018, the Advocate General for Scotland moved what he described as a series of very complex and extensive amendments to the bill. These included the provision which brought the particular uh, provision into force uh, on royal assent. Um, and it was the coming into force of that provision on royal assent which changed the, uh, which was the critical change to the limits of legislative competence which have uh, led to the uh, decision of the Supreme Court this morning. Keith Brown to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, while it's possible, of course, to look in wonder and laugh at the verbal contortions of barrack room lawyers who questioned the competency of this bill uh, and are now trying desperately to try and pretend that the vindication is given by the Supreme Court, it has serious implications. Can I ask the 
Lord Advocate, um, in relation uh, to the point, first of all, raised by Bruce Crawford on human rights, but also in relation to the programme of statutory instruments which this Parliament is considering, can the Lord Advocate lay, if there any implications from this ruling in relation to that work that's currently being going on? He will be aware we are having to agree, for example, statutory instruments without seeing the content of them in advance. Um, does this ruling have any implications on that process? Lord Advocate. I don't, think it, uh, I don't think it is a direct impact. Uh, as the member and, and, all, and all members will be very well aware, um, the government has been, as um, any responsible government um, requires to, has been um, carrying out work with a view to readying the statute book against withdrawal from the European Union and has been using powers in the EU uh, Withdrawal uh, Act uh, to that effect and, and where appropriate, cooperating uh, with the UK government um, to that end. Um, that work has been ongoing and will continue, um, and so the decision of the Supreme Court, um, I, I, I don't see having any immediate uh, impact on that uh, programme of work, a necessary programme of work. James Kelly to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the difficulties for parliamentarians at the outset of parliamentary consideration of the continuity bill was that in terms of legal competence a different view had been taken from the presiding officer and the Lord Advocate on behalf of the, the government. So can I ask the Lord Advocate has there been any consideration learn, uh, given to learning the lessons from that in terms of a review of processes, communications between the two legal teams to try and avoid a situation where the, the, the Parliament and the Lord Advocate on behalf of the government come to different legal opinions in future? Lord Advocate. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Kelly for that question. And as I said in the statement that I made when this bill was introduced, it's important to recognise that the presiding officer and I have separate and important constitutional functions in relation to the introduction of any government bill. And it's important that um, each of us um, uh, uh, approaches those functions with, 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 with care. And I know that the presiding officer in this case approached the issue with, 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 with great care and integrity. Um, as I said during the course of the statement, that, uh, in, in the course of discussion on that statement, um, the legal issues with which we, we have been dealing, were dealing in relation to this bill, were ones on which reasonable legal minds could disagree. Um, the presiding officer formed our judgment, um, <coughs> as he's required to do by statute, and I formed uh, my judgment, as I'm required <coughs> to do uh, by statute. Um, in the normal course of events, there are discussions between um, the parliamentary authorities <coughs> and lawyers for the Scottish Government about any government bill that is introduced to identify any issues and to consider whether those can be uh, resolved. Um, I think parliamentarians may take some comfort from the fact that this, as so far as I know, is the first time, the first time in the history of this parliament that we've had a situation where um, the presiding officer and the government have taken a different view on the competence of a bill. Um, so that is a process that um, works well, works routinely, um, it was followed in this case. Um, in this case, um, the difference of view wasn't uh, resolved. Um, uh, that, from time to time, is bound to happen when, as, as we do, uh, we're dealing with um, what are sometimes difficult uh, uh, legal questions. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you. Given the UK government's actions and its intentions, intentions which in my view were not only clear but also clearly malign intentions. I think this parliament has a responsibility to try to give effect to the improvements that were made to this bill during its scrutiny and passage. In particular, we need the Lord Advocate's uh, advice on how best that can be achieved. In relation to the environmental principles, section 26A survives the, this judgment with the exception, as the Lord Advocate has said, of subsection six, but it's that subsection which is the only link to the environmental treaties, uh, environmental principles set out in EU treaty and the interpretation of those principles by the European Court. Uh, 
Will it be possible, in the Lord Advocate's view, to replace that link in some other way, to restore that link? Uh, because if we can't, we risk having an environmental principles section of this legislation, which could be as vague and woolly as that in the UK uh, EU Withdrawal Bill Act. Sorry. Yes. Lord Advocate. Um, as I said in my statement, the government will be considering the terms of the judgment carefully and, and will wish to discuss with all parties across the chamber the way forward. Um, I, I saw this judgment for the first time this morning, uh, as, as um, uh, other members did, and uh, I hope the member will forgive me in not offering a snap legal opinion on the particular uh, and interesting question which he's uh, raised. <coughs> Tavis Scott to be followed by Claire Adamson. Can, may I thank the Lord Advocate for the statement as well this afternoon. This judgment does confirm the Scottish Bill as a whole would not be outside the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament when we voted it through. What's more, the difference between the situation before and after passage of the UK Act gives weight to the view that the UK reduced the powers of this Parliament. Does the Lord Advocate agree that the UK Government needs to learn from this and make sure that if Brexit does indeed go ahead, the devolved administrations are fully involved in developing UK-wide frameworks with proper dispute resolution mechanisms? And will he confirm that uh, Section 13 to keep pace uh, with EU law can be implemented without the other sections of the Bill that the Supreme Court said had been overtaken by the UK Act? Lord Advocate. Yes. On the first point, um, um, well, the government's, government's position is, is on record. Um, as a law officer, I'm obviously concerned that the constitutional arrangements under which this parliament and this government operate are, uh, are followed. Uh, and it is um, satisfying that the constitutional analysis that was put forward by the three devolved law officers mm -hmm. uh, has been uh, accepted by the Supreme Court in this judgment. Um, the member is correct that the keeping pace power um, would not be, within, would not be um, out with competence were it now to become law. Claire Adamson to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you. Lord Advocate, the presiding officer ruled that the continuity bill was out with the competence because the Parliament is, and I quote, bound to act, with, act compatibly with EU law until such point as the treaty cease to apply. And further said, this prevents the Parliament from exercising legislative power now, even though it assumes it will be legally able to act in the future. End quote. Lord Advocate, did the Supreme Court judgment agree with the presiding officer's ruling? Lord Advocate. Um, as I said a moment ago in answer to another question, um, and as I acknowledged when we met um, in February, uh, the question upon which the presiding officer and I disagreed was one upon which reasonable legal minds could disagree. And um, uh, as, as, I, as both of us acknowledged in our respective statements, only the court could finally uh, and authoritatively uh, decide that issue or the other legal issues that arise in relation to this bill. Uh, the Supreme Court on, on that particular issue has preferred the uh, arguments which I advanced. Um, uh, uh, that uh, should not be taken as a, a criticism of the presiding officer who has a responsibility uh, to exercise um, his judgment on the legal issues which arise in the context of bills such as this one. Jamie Green to be followed by Stuart Willen. Uh, presenting also, today's ruling not only vindicates your own decision making to question the competency of this bill or parts of it, but it also should serve as a reminder to all of us as legislators that when we rush legislation through this parliament, this is where we end up. The Lord Advocate has stated, if I may, the Lord Advocate has stated that the Scottish Government will accept the judgment in its entirety and in an answer to a previous question that there's a possibility that it may be brought before us again in some shape or form. If that is the case, does the Lord Advocate believe that this should go through the normal and robust three-stage process with due scrutiny that every bill that goes through this place deserves rather than via the emergency procedure that rushed it through this Parliament in March of this year? Lord Advocate. Lord Advocate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as I said earlier in, in these exchanges, um, when this Parliament uh, passed this bill, 
It was with the exception of one provision within the competence of the Parliament. The rules changed after this Parliament passed the bill. Uh, as to the process which should be followed in, in uh, any reconsideration or in any future uh, process, that's entirely a matter of the parliamentary authorities. It wouldn't be, a it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on it. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, uh, the Lord Advocate earlier on has mentioned on a couple of occasions a protected enactment and the amendment that took place on the 2nd of May. Uh, but I'd be grateful if the Lord Advocate could actually clarify that did the UK Government make it clear at the time what the effect on the continuity bill would be or did they wait until they were in the Supreme Court? Lord Advocate. Uh, when, these amend when this amendment was made to the, uh, to the EU withdrawal bill, it formed one of uh, a number of amendments that were presented to the House of Lords as, and I quote, a series of very complex and extensive amendments to the bill. Uh, and the particular, particular issue that the members identified uh, w w was not specifically drawn to the attention of the House of Lords. Mm. Polly McNeill to be followed by Willie Coffey. Does the Lord Advocate agree that it is largely an important decision for devolution in this Parliament that had the continuity bill but for those sections uh, and the withdrawal bill would have survived and in fact, as the judgment says, rejected all of the UK government law officers except for section 17? Would he agree that is an important constitutional point for devolution? But in relation to section 12 and international obligations, I wonder the Lord Advocate could provide some preliminary view of whether that would provide some scope for the replacement of Section 5, which, of course, as has been mentioned, uh, reference to the Charter of Fundamental Rights in Domestic Law, without which it does have a losing effect to many people who have substantial rights flowing from that. Could Section 12 provide an alternative, and is there one to that? Lord Advocate. Yes. On, on the member's first point, I, I agree that this is an important legal judgment in, uh, for the devolution settlement. Um, it has uh, a, a lot in it which, um, which will be important for this parliament and indeed for uh, both this government and the UK government going, going forward in terms of the fundamental analysis which the court uh, has identified. Um, on the specific point in relation to the use of Section 12, again, I hope the member will forgive me if I don't um, give a, a, a snap view, view on the point. What I can say, as I said in my statement, is that the Scottish Government will consider ways in which the values reflected in the Charter can continue to be given effect uh, in Scots law uh, should the UK leave the European Union. And there may be uh, various uh, ways in which that might be done. Willie Coffey to be followed by Mike Rumbles. President officer, the UK government has lost the Miller case over triggering Article 50. It has lost the case brought by Scottish parliamentarians over the revocability of Article 50 and now this case over whether the Scottish Parliament can choose its own path through the mess of Brexit. Could the Lord Advocate confirm that the UK government has effectively lost three important pieces of Brexit litigation? Lord Advocate. Um. Well, I think, I think the record, uh, the record um, it, it, it speaks for itself in terms of the decisions of uh, the various courts that have ruled on issues arising from Brexit. What's undoubtedly true is that the withdrawal from the European Union has thrown up uh, a number of uh, difficult, important uh, and serious constitutional issues which have uh, found their way into the courts and the courts have uh, issued the rulings that they have. Mike Rumbles. The Supreme Court has said that Section 17, the key section of the Bill, is out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament and always was, meaning that this Bill couldn't have received royal assent on this point alone. We have a politically independent presiding officer in our Parliament who on legal advice ruled that this Bill was not competent. Does the Lord Advocate not accept that it was a mistake to ignore the presiding officer's competency ruling and advise the government to press on with this bill, nonetheless, without amendment. Lord Advocate. Yes, I, th I think um, the question of, whether, of the significance or otherwise of Section 17 is obviously a matter upon which opinions could differ. It certainly doesn't go to the heart of the uh, 
uh, bill in terms of the uh, securing legal uh, continuity. Um, um, and indeed, the remainder of the bill stands um, in its entirety without uh, that section. Um, I think what can be said is that in the reference, the UK law, law office has mounted a whole-scale attack on the bill in its entirety, and it was, uh, uh, and with the exception of that single argument in relation to that single section, the attack has been uh, rebuffed. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much, and that concludes. Point of order, Stuart Stevenson. Um, Presiding Officer, uh, Mr Finlay uh, correctly said that for all bills you provide a point of view as to whether the bill just been discussed falls within or without the competence of this Parliament. I'm confident that in reaching your conclusion in this bill you would have taken appropriate advice. Now, at paragraph 7 of the judgment it says, the presiding officer opined that the Scottish Parliament could not seek to exercise competence before that competence had been transferred to it. And at paragraphs 82 and 83, uh, in those two paragraphs respectively, lays out the positions of the UK government and of the Lord Advocate. But at paragraph 85 says, prospective legislative provision for the consequences of the repeal of the 1972 Act, which has no legal effect until such repeal, entails no modification of that Act. The challenge under section 29.2c of the Scotland Act therefore fails. Given that that has been the judgment uh, of the Supreme Court presiding officer, that we may in future legislate uh, for foreseeable events, um, are you going to uh, consider and I think you will not wish to respond immediately, presiding officer, because it's probably a complex issue. But are you going to consider uh, whether in future it's appropriate to take advice that may potentially lead to a different conclusion on another occasion? Can I thank uh, Mr Stevenson for his point of order? In fact, I, I'm interested to note that Mr Stevenson both asked the question and then answered it as well, <laughs> which is very, very helpful. Uh, yes, Mr Stevenson is right. The advice that I offer is offered to all members. It's not offered in either support or opposition to a bill. It is taken impartially. It is there. It is not a court ruling. The court ruling has been made by the Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, as Mr Stevenson accurately points out, it will be for myself and officials to consider this matter in some depth, which we will do. I thank the member for the point of order. I thank all members and the Lord Advocate for the statement and questions. We'll move on now to the next item of business. We'll just take a short pause for the minister and members to change seats and in fact for the presiding officer to do so.